Have you taken a photo lately? Maybe you took it a few minutes ago, maybe earlier today or yesterday. Maybe you have uploaded into a social media platform, maybe Facebook. Well, little did you know where it is actually stored, physically stored. It'll be in a place like this in Cluny, Ireland, or in Lulea, Sweden, which are the two main data centers of Facebook here in Europe. What are data centers? Well, there are these warehouses, very big warehouses, with electronic racks, row up and row, and they store all our data. They are the most powerful industry now, where information is the most valuable thing. And what is the energy consumption of these data centers, of storing our data, processing our data? And we're going to have even more abundance of data in the presence or in the upcoming of 5G communication. What is 5G? Well, it's beyond 3 and 4G. In 3G, I would communicate with you with a, via a machine or an electronic device. In 5G, machines will communicate with machines. Everything will be connected. It will be this web of communication. Everything will be smart. Smart city, smart building, smart healthcare, smart everything. And there is more data that will be in abundance, a tsunami of data. Where is all this data going to be stored? What is the power or the energy of this data? And what we can do with all this data, how we can process this data. Now, let's look a little bit of data use over the last year and also the impact of COVID. We have up to 70% of more mobile phone users or smartphone users. Everything is growing, even in terms of laptops, computers, streaming. We all like Netflix, I guess. It's an amazing and abundance a frightening even amount of data that we are consuming, but also generating. Look at this snapshot here, what's happening every 60 seconds on the internet. There are hundreds and thousands of Zoom meetings, Netflix streams, Instagrams, tweets, and by the time I finish this talk, would be hundreds of millions of dollars used on the internet. Alarming. It's just the beginning. Now, we reached in 2017 1.1 zettabytes of data use. This is unprecedented. By 2022, there will be 4.2 zettabytes. If you didn't know what a zettabyte is, it has 21 zeros behind it. Now, internet, it's bigger in terms of energy consumption than a country like Japan or or even Switzerland. Now we will see even more of that. Look into the projections here and what the studies show. By 2030, the electronic industry will be consuming 21% of the electricity. So that means one-fifth of the Earth's global power. It will be on our electronic devices and powering data centers. In terms of carbon emission, that's about 14%, making it globally the most polluting and power-hungry industry. It's not going to be aviation, it's not going to be our cars, it's going to be our electronics, things we use day to day. Now, these are frightening, alarming, bringing awareness maybe, you name it, but they are there. Now, look a little bit about their lifetime. At best, maybe we use three to five years, our devices. 18% of electronic waste is recycled, 18. 82% end up in landfill, in mountains of electronics. Now, look a little bit of this chart here showing what has happened to the electronic waste and which countries produce the most. Of course, China is up there, United States, Japan, some European countries. Look into the far right kilogram per capita. Well, France is actually up there on top five contenders. We don't recycle much. We like to use them. We don't recycle much. 
So the electronic industry is really revolutionizing our lives, the way we work, the way we entertain, where we live, how we communicate one another. But what's the impact of all this industry in our environment? Why do electronics consume so much power? Can we do something about it? Well, that has been my quest. I have a PhD in computer engineering from UC Santa Barbara, and my PhD was how we can actually optimize or reduce the power of microprocessors, which is the building block of an electronic system. Even my, after my PhD, I felt like there is so much to do into how we can actually reduce the power of electronic system. I felt I was just at the start of it. So I moved from US to France, I joined CNRS, and together with my team, I kept on looking at this problem is, can we build energy efficient electronics? Where is the power consumption going? Can we do better? And we stripped down the problem. We looked at it at the system level, architectural level, circuit, all the way to transistor, and even the materials they are made of. We found out that there are some materials, such as carbon nanotubes here, and 2D materials, that indeed have excellent physical properties. They switch faster, and they also are ultra low power, and they are very compact, they are atomic thin. So we can do amazing things with them, and we are currently exploring to build a technology in these materials. But still, we need to go beyond the way we classically compute. So in physics, there is a theoretical limit about how, you, how much energy you need to compute or to even compare between two physical states, like a zero and a one. But our classical machines are way beyond this computing limit. So we needed to figure out, we need to find a better way, we need to think how we design or how the computing is done. And the inspiration came from nature more specifically from the brain. Now look at this little image here. You can see that neurons are firing with neurons in a web of connected via synapses. This is how we actually learn, how we memorize. This is how our brain builds plasticity as we grow. Our new connections between neurons to neurons via these synapses. And the brain is a very powerful computing machine, if you want to call it that way. It consumes about 20 to 25 watts, which is less than a lamp, and it's very efficient in computing a lot of tasks. So can we design electronic system in a similar way like the brain, or what we call it, brain-inspired design? So I am part of a community that is looking into ultra-low power brain-inspired electronics. So on one side you have the biological neuron and synapses, and on the other side you have the electronic neurons and synapses that we are developing using these nanomaterials in order to emulate the biological neural networks, for example, like these circles here connected with other circles, like neurons connecting with other neurons via synapses to build this web of connectivity things that you can compute much faster and consuming very ultra low power that can be deployed in your next electronics. This will change. This will be a paradigm change on how we actually compute and how the electronics would look like. And this is also in the framework of a European project that I'm actually working with many academics and, indus and from industry as well to bring this technology so it's deployed, so we make a change in terms of energy efficiency and power consumption of our electronic devices. So we as scientists feel like this is a turning point. We need to make the technology environmental friendly. We, not, we cannot keep on going like nothing matters. This is, an, this is an important point for us, a turning point for a whole community. And I'm happy to hear from the State of the Union, from European Commission, the statement that made that we need to reduce the, the emissions by 55% by 2030. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but it's a big step toward changing the way 
that we are actually using our data and also the data centers and the emission that they bring into our environment. So it'll take actors like us, scientists, technologists, academia, policymakers, but also you as the end user. We need a cultural shift toward this digital sobriety. So yeah, I would leave you with four main suggestions. There are many of them, but these are simple enough for you to apply. If you were to buy next time an electronic system, please look into the specs and choose one with the least amount of power. And please use them longer and recycle them properly. Refurbish, reformat them if you have to, but use them longer and really don't just throw them on the trash. You can take them into a recycling center. And about your computers in your institutions, you know, at night, you can turn it off. You think they are in power mode, in sleep mode, and they are in ultra-low power mode, but no. In a large scale, they are consuming a lot of power. When you're not using, just turn it off. And the last one is to use these collaborative shared platforms versus email. So if I were to send an email to N people with an attachment, that would be copied N times in the data center for each person I send it to. Rather than creating a lot of these copies unnecessarily, just use one link, one shared thing that everybody can refer to. Now that would make a difference. There are institutions or people that write, you know, hundreds of emails and at institutional level there can be thousands of emails. And 60 text emails with no attachment is about one kilometer of car driving in terms of emission. So how many kilometers are you driving a day that you didn't even know about just by your emails? Simple things like this make a difference in terms of the data, the power, also their emission, and also how we use our electronics. So we are all actors into this and we all can make an impact and the change is really for all of us, for scientists, for you as end users, and for our governments and policymakers. So please, take, play your part and take this also seriously. Thank you.